Buenos días a todos y todas. Good morning, everyone. Bienvenida a la sesión plenaria. Welcome to plenary session science and technology for integrated risk management and climate change adaptation. This is within the framework of the eighth regional platform for disaster risk reduction in the Americas and the Caribbean. As you know, these regional platforms provide for universal accessibility. That's why the session of this event have sign language interpretation and real-time subtitles. Besides, this is a session that it is conducted in a hybrid mode, which means that besides the public present here, more than 800 people, there are many people that are connected online through hopping. So these people who are connected online, and we also greet them and welcome them, good morning to them as well, we remind them that the catapult team will be at their disposal throughout the event to solve any technical issues that may arise. So you can contact the team through the uh, persons tab. You can identify them easily because you will see catapult productions next to their names. So if you have any technical issues, you can solve them through that uh, line. This session is organized by the United Nations Office for Disaster Dis Risk uh, Reduction Regional Office for the Americas and the Caribbean and the Science and Technology Advisory Group for the region. The moderator of this session will be uh, done by David Smith, who has more than 30 years postdoctoral experience in the society and the academic world, the private sector and the United Nations, focusing on sustainable development, conservation of biodiversity, climate change, and disaster risk reduction. Currently runs the Center for Environmental Management and he's the coordinator of the Institute for Sustainable Development at the University of the West Indies. He was a member of the group of independent scientists that produced the Global Sustainable Development Report 2019 and he's the Caribbean chair of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. He's also a member of the uh, Scientific and Political Advisory Committee of the Inter-American Institute for Global Change, and he's associate editor of the journal Environmental Policy and Law. His work is currently focused on reducing the risk of climate-related disasters and the effect of climate on developmentally disabled and uh, human beings. The floor is yours, David. Bienvenidos a todos. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. So we I can only use restaurant uh, terms in Spanish. In several different languages. We are here to talk about, and for the next few days, understand more how the science will be able to help us with disasters. This is very important for our region. All of us remember from school history the stories of how our capitals may have been destroyed by an earthquake or a fire or a hurricane. And more recently, of course, we understand how life can be disrupted by a global health pandemic. We need to find ways to be able to address these problems because these events affect our sustainable development and affect our ability to improve human well-being and to reach the sustainable development goals. Waste, inequality, biodiversity loss, and climate change are four big things that will stop us from achieving those goals. But we do know that science will help us to get over those barriers. But science by itself will not help. People in labs will do work, and we will never understand what they did because they speak in a language which we don't always understand. So it is vital 
for that science to be translated and communicated in ways which people appreciate and can use. It is vital that science and policy interact with each other and that we learn to speak each other's languages so that we can implement the science in the way that it is supposed to be implemented to help solve our problems. Our panel is going to be speaking about this in many different perspectives. We are going to hear first from Mami and she will speak and then what will happen after that is our panel will have their time to speak as well and I will ask questions of them as well. And we hope that we'll have a little bit of a discussion. We have water, no tea, but we will have a discussion. I'm going to now invite Mami to please take the podium and to help us to understand where we start the dialogue. Thank you. Gracias, David. Thank you very much, David. Mrs. Vice President of Uruguay, distinguished panelists. We're all women, aren't we? Speaking about science and technology, this is wonderful. It is a great pleasure for me to open this space and to share with you some thoughts on the importance of science and technology. For effective action in disaster risk reduction. We are undergoing a critical time at the world, uh, regional and national level, where we need to strengthen our efforts in order to accomplish our agendas. The task of managing disaster risks depends on the scientific knowledge and on the technical development that's based on evidence. The regional report on disaster risk assessment in Latin America and the Caribbean called RAR21 fosters a fundamental change in the understanding of disaster risk and its causes. Among other reasons of concern, there's first the availability of information on risks. Second, the need to address the deep causes of disasters. Third, the urgency of promoting sustainable investments in the corrective management and prospective management of risk. And fourth, the need to understand and manage this risk in a better way in a recently more urban region. All these issues require a transition in the governance approach going from a response focus to an effort that's centered on risk management or prevention management. All these ideas point out the need to have a scientific and technological community that's tightly linked to policy development. For example, we cannot address earthquakes without understanding where and how the uh, earth uh, crust moves and how the different uh, materials behave, as well as the compression structures to see seismic pressures. At the same time, having earthquake-resistant buildings entail applying construction and design methods that are adapted to them, as well as policy frameworks that uh, ensure this implementation. Another example, we cannot achieve greater resilience of communities without knowing the social factors as well as the cultural environment of the affected society without using the concepts and tools of social knowledge as well as traditional knowledge. The evidence presented in 
RAR 2021 identifies Latin America and the Caribbean as the second region that's most prone to disasters globally, since one every four disasters around the globe happens here. The Sendai framework emphasizes the need to know and understand the disaster risk as a requirement and a foundation for proper management and reduction. Although the science in the investment in science and technology of the countries in the region is not at the right level yet, the scientific community of the region has really managed to generate major progress in terms of knowing risk based on their research. Here, we need to reinforce scientific cooperation, which is a key factor for uh, informed decision-making in connection with the reduction of uh, disasters, taking into account the challenges linked to data and the interaction between science and politics. We also know that in the region there is a major challenge of building and systematization of information on damages and losses by countries. The challenge of working these factors has to do with how we can make progress using risk information and transforming this information into useful and practical knowledge for all the decision-making processes in connection with development. But the true challenge lies in the fact that we don't have human or uh, practical. financial resources that are sufficient for, for putting this into practice. It is important to foster support and resources in science and technology for disaster risk reduction. But we also need to understand the existing challenges that prevent the political uh, and decision makers from making a better use of scientific research available. Along these lines, at UNDR, we have worked with the Regional Advisory Group on Science and Technology, our STAG, to come up with a regional research agenda on this topic, which has been made available for this event of this platform on the web page. This has been a collective effort that entailed identifying gaps and proposing regional priorities for a better articulation between knowledge, production, and the implementation of public policies. The discussion on development access and use of technology should also consider the context of inequality and exclusion prevailing in the region, which has concrete manifestations in the abilities to use and take advantage of technology. The pandemic has illustrated the digital divide and how millions of people do not have the same opportunities for adapting to the virtual world. To conclude, we hope that this platform that is thematically centered on the relationship between scientific knowledge and the implementation of public policy will be useful for bridging the gaps, for building bridges so that we can have a more effective risk reduction for more sustainable and resilient development. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mami Mizutori. I want to welcome Her Excellency um, Beatrice Ajimon and welcome you to the panel. 
We're privileged to have you here, and we would very much like to hear from you and your thoughts on this matter. Please feel free to use the microphone if you wish, or if you wish the podium as well. Okay. Muy buenos días. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I would like to start by welcoming you all, particularly those of you who have come from faraway places. And today we have the privilege of having you here in Uruguay, a country that, that you like. We are pleased to welcome you here at Punta del Este, which is without a doubt one of our wonders. I'd like to thank the organizers of such a major event. So I'd like to uh, thank the offices representing the United Nations, but I would also like to thank the experts here at the national level. We know how hard they have worked to organize such a major event, where fortunately the number of attendees is sufficient evidence of how successful it is. So I would like to congratulate the organizers who have made this meeting possible so that we can see the and like contact with other attendees who are connected online. Here, there are experts on a topic that is increasingly urging us to reflect, to make a commitment from many of us, not to speak of those of you who are present here. Of course, I'm not going to speak from the technical point of view about what you are doing. Because that's not my position. I have been invited to share this event with you. And I stand here as from my uh, political side. We have been interacting with my team who's made up of young people and it is really significant to see that the work that all of you have done has led to the awareness of new generations where this topic without a doubt is one of their priorities. In reviewing the United Nations webpage, I started to think how I could discuss this topic and I focused on a phrase which is highly motivating to me. Every decision and action we take makes us more vulnerable to disasters or on the contrary, more resilient. This phrase, I believe, puts us at, at this decision-making point as to where or on which side we want to stand, particularly for rulers, for politicians. Something that was warned to us a few years ago about climate change and how that was going to affect our daily lives. Phenomena that we thought that there were if like potential or faraway events, without a doubt, today we are aware that this topic should be a priority in public policy development. And there is another topic that was in a way part of the takeaways, at least in, in, in my country, from the pandemic. Obviously, we all know how important science and technology are in our lives, but many times, when actions are taken, particularly for national budgets, sometimes that balance is not taken into account because we know, 
when a budget is developed, that priorities need to be organized very well. When in Uruguay we had to face, as soon as we took office, so as soon as we took office, the first cases of COVID started. And one of the first actions that were taken was to make an expert group, a group of experts on different scientific disciplines, which through a commission which was called GATCH, because it was a multidisciplinary committee that included mathematics, health, disciplines, everything that had to do with the pandemic. That entailed a very important political decision, which made the political system to reflect how important it is to act jointly and to listen. Essential actions had to be, had to be taken. It was something that was proven that they, we needed to work together and just to relate each other rather than just to work separately. I think this was a learning not only at the executive level, but also at the legislative level. And I think this is extremely important. And as a chair of this national parliament, uh, you know that Uruguay is, has a high level of democracy. In our country, the parliament has a very intense life. And then it was uh, getting for the first time this Futures Commission. One of the main and priority topics in this national parliament is also related with everything that you are dealing here with. We have quite a novelty model where all parties before all uh, electoral campaigns can debate and discuss about this topic and then would just uh, discuss it in their own political platforms. For, the, for us, this has been an important point. This is related to everything that you have been asking for all the time that you have raised awareness. There is no doubt that there is no other option than that. The world has just given us a lot of signs and signals that are pretty clear that we just need to work together and use technology as a, and science as one of the main drivers. In a society like ours that is small but very well formed, we also decided to make different steps. And the exercise that we are discussing here, we have isolated events and they seem that they are just eventual uh, topics. For instance, the flooding that had been every now and then. And now we can notice that if we have the different measures so we can have all the situations that we can present here. Times has changed. And therefore, the demanding actions and to be updated in the different events is also setting a story, especially for difficult times. There's no doubt that we have a new generation here. We shouldn't forget all the societies that are becoming essential, essential to act among the difference of with youth using different disciplines. So it's not only about asking for some advice, a certain topic, we need to work together and also with this different projection. Why? Because the answer is uh, faster and faster and it, it's more demanding. Uruguay three years ago, has this drought. 
And the first instance was to provide an answer, and especially by using this institutionality that I'm going to tell you later on, that has been extremely important for our country. Of course, we have taken different measures that, of course, are collaborating and helping that crisis. During the second year, we were more prepared. But for this third year, it was really an important year to say that even from today, we are all working because everything is already being stalled. And I'm saying all this because the main system is also providing faster answers and is also a focus to prevention. Why? Because we saw that this is a series of phenomena that is happening once in a while. But uh, it is very clear for me that we have a clear perspective and all the Uruguayans that are here present will remember on the 23 and 24th of August on 2005. And this is a particular evening, and especially for those who are not from the country. Well, and let me tell you that this is where all the people from Uruguay get out for the nostalgia night. There wasn't any prevention for that particular night. However, we were surprised by a storm, and they had a different effects material and uh, for the people. And even I can say, if I'm allowed to, that even from the social perspective, there was a change, the before and after of that particular night. Particular night. After several days that we were surprised of everything that had happened, where the Sinai, that is the national emergency system that is playing an extremely paramount role here at the society, told us that it was an extratropical cyclone with 174 kilometers per hour winds and also was at the south of uh, the country for over 10 hours. From there, we were able to see more phenomena as it has happened all around the world. That, and it was not only about the scientific aspect, it was just try to make all the people on the population aware of it, to see exactly what is still essential, to have a specific institution collaborate for all these political decisions. And this, of course, couldn't be immediate, but it has to be involved for prevention. And I can see, and my apologies, because I'm a good politician, so I keep talking. However, I've noticed that my time is almost over. I would like to wrap up with the institutionality. The leading or ruling institution is the Sinai, the, for the emergency system in the country. And this is quite relevant for all of us. Within the action line, we can see that there is a national policy for comprising all these phenomena from 2019 to 2030. Now, I would like to say, as the phrase mentioned, so that we are just setting a resilient development based on the preventive culture. That's why it really called my attention, the phrase at the beginning, I'm a phrase, and this is exactly what I'm part of. This is the main axis, the core for these norms of our emergency system. 
Our country has this uh, normative and rules and framework that is with the rule of 621 that created the system. However, the Sinai law, along with a group of conventions and international treaties, can also make us to ratify that everything that we understand as a country, and it is also essential to provide a legal framework to have some actions. We are also with a rectification at the parliament, so everything that is being shown around the world should also be included as a tool in order to strengthen our public policies. This law also sets a responsibility framework for this uh, disaster risk management for prevention, mitigation, attendance, attention, response, rehabilitation, and recovery for emergency and disaster uh, situations at the national and uh, state level. The government is talking about the different strategic axes or lines in terms of policies. The national policies will get organized based on seven strategic lines, which are also comprised by the different measures that you can have in the legislation. All of that is detailed in the legislation. So to close up or to close the session, we are preparing for all these type of situations. We have different instruments. We have different measures. The government has created for the first time an environment ministry. A ministry that is working in coordination with the other areas in order to prevent the importance so we can work all together in prevention measures. And another thing, if you allow me, there is a long time that I been part of this uh, cons construction. The educational system also should include this awareness that is essential of everything that implies all these topics, in addition of the importance that when budget is a matter and everything that is being said in norms and regulations should also, along with public policy, so we can state out or rule out so we can point out, sorry, the, the importance of resiliency, not only in terms of an individual commitment, but also from the, at the state level. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thanks very much for your examples of how Uruguay managed COVID. Uh, when we come to questions, I'll be asking you, I think I heard you say that while COVID was going on, you also had a drought. Um, so I think we'd be very interested to hear how you manage both those emergencies at the same time. But thank you very much. Our next um, panelist is Dr. Mona Nima. She is the Chief Science Advisor for the Government of Canada. And she is going to be speaking from her um, perspective of as a doctor and professor of molecular cardiology, I believe. Um, so please, you have the microphone. Gracias. Thank you very much. Uh, Excellency colleagues, uh, es un placer estar aquí en un hermoso país de Uruguay. It is a pleasure of being here in this uh, lovely country. Calling on Montreal, so it's much better to be here. Thank you so much to the UNDRR and uh, Mami Mustori for the invitation to be here, and thank you, Dr. Smith, for the kind introduction. Science and technology, as already mentioned, play a key role in integrated disaster risk management and climate change adaptation at many levels, from preparedness to mitigation, response, and recovery, and I think this is what you mentioned by resiliency. This, of course, is recognized in the Sunday framework, and I completely agree with you, Dr. Smith, that it's also how we bring science to society, including to policymakers, that is uh, also an area that we need to be looking into. So let's talk about preparedness. Effective disaster preparedness requires risk identification, data-driven risk assessments, robust early warning systems, and plans for efficient public communication. 
Science and technology are key, of course, to data gathering and analysis, including monitoring geospatial uh, data using the remote sensing technologies, modeling climate change impacts, and forecasting risks. Changing environments have cascading effects on all of these elements, which is why simulation exercises that focus on the logistics of the emergency response must include a science advice component to ensure that scientific and technical evidence is up to date. When it comes to mitigation, coastal integrity and resilient infrastructure are of course important elements of mitigation. They rely on both technological and science-informed nature-based solutions, so in all cases, you need science. I'll give you an example from, from Canada. The city of Vancouver, a coastal city, is investing in green rainwater infrastructure to manage stormwater and reduce the risk of flooding. This infrastructure includes green spaces, but also porous pavements which absorb and filter stormwater. This approach not only reduces the risk of flooding, but also helps to improve the city's resilience to climate change. Nature-based solutions are also used to deliver both climate and biodiversity co-benefits, helping to reduce the impacts of climate-related disasters. So in Canada, we've committed to planting 2 billion trees over 10 years and to conserve 30% of Canada's land and water by 2030. These seemingly simple uh, commitments actually need, inf are, need to be informed by rigorous science will, and it, they will help reduce coastal erosion because if you plant the wrong trees on the wrong land, then you're not ahead at all. In addition, they will also improve air and water quality and cool our urban centers, helping in turn to overcome the increasingly frequent uh, problems of heat waves. Disasters of any kind have ripple effects on multiple sectors, like health, transport, and education, irrespective of how they start. This is why science needs to be at the table at the start to anticipate the cascading effects, suggest mitigation strategies, and plan appropriate responses for impacted sectors. So I'll give you some examples from the COVID. So in the COVID-19 response, we all appreciate how it came to involve multiple sectors, besides, of course, at the beginning, epidemiology and health, including both physical and mental health. In providing science advice to our government for pandemic response, I consulted over 200 experts in various fields, including mathematics, virology, health systems, but also environmental sciences, education, and psychology. And I applaud your government putting together from the get-go an expert panel that is multidisciplinary. I'd like to specifically highlight the value of having social and behavioral scientists at this very early stage of the, of the pandemic. So, uh, oh, I have some problems here with my technology. <laughs> So, so the examples I was going to give were actually at the very beginning when everybody was worried about the virus moving from one person to the others. These social scientists, from the get-go, they anticipated the potential social consequences of some of the public health measures, including the impact on women, specifically on children and on vulnerable communities. In fact, they predicted many of the unfortunate things that we saw later on, including the rise in domestic violence and the impact on learning outcomes for children from vulnerable communities. They shared early data on the pandemic mental health impacts and advised on mitigation strategies by engaging Canadians to be active agents and part of the solution. And I think this is a lesson for climate change. We can't have only climate anxiety. We need people to be part of the solution. The advice from cross-disciplinary expert panels was invaluable in managing the pandemic, and it will no doubt be beneficial in managing any disaster.
In addition to science advice, responding to disasters involves the use of real-time data and modeling. Relevant data can come from multiple sectors, government, academia, industry, civil society. So we need to have mechanisms in place to receive, analyze, and use these data. And this has to be an integral part of our resilience as well. And just like countries rely on the military and humanitarian workforce during emergencies, the science workforce and the science infrastructure, whether inside or outside government, can be tapped for help, acting effectively as the technical surge capacity. So, to give examples, environmental researchers can conduct water safety testing when water pipes have been damaged in an earthquake or measure pollution in the atmosphere after a wildfire. In the case of COVID, they helped us develop wastewater, which actually was um, incredibly helpful in predicting how the, the virus was doing in different communities. A biochemist can run diagnostic tests like PCR testing, and we saw many actually academic scientists help governments and early on in the pandemic. And allied health professionals can administer vaccines. And again, we've seen how we called upon all of them for mass vaccination in our countries. Last but not least, science and technology play a crucial role in supporting recovery and rebuilding efforts. As climate change alters the landscape, new infrastructure will need to withstand the current and anticipated risks. Using flood mapping combined with modeling, we can avoid rebuilding in known and anticipated flood zones. And as we build back better, there's a place for climate smart solutions. Our current infrastructure is far too reliant on fossil fuels. If the electricity grid is down, Key services like cell towers, hospitals, and even data centers are reliant on fuel for their generators. We need technological innovations to rely on resilient energy sources and to honor our net zero commitment. So as we work together regionally and globally to reduce disaster risk, let's not forget the importance of knowledge sharing and international collaborations, both to build capacity and to ensure that the benefits of science and research are shared by all. The Canadian government has established the Caribbean Disaster Risk Management Program to help improve the ability of the Caribbean region to prepare for and respond to natural disasters such as hurricanes and floods. The program is one example that where we are working together to generate, manage and share knowledge of comprehensive disaster management and climate change adaptation. I submit to you that early collaborations at the level of academic research and government research is equally as important. So to conclude, as we collectively work towards meeting the Sunday framework objective, science and technology have a role to play in all priority areas. We can tap into the breadth of knowledge held by researchers in social and natural sciences as well as the invaluable contributions of indigenous knowledge holders, and let us forget the vast expertise of practitioners and first responders. For sure, there are still challenges, but let's commit to including science and scientists at the table from the get-go and using data, evidence, and technology as we work towards the goal of zero climate disasters. Gracias. Thank you. Dr. Nima, thank you very much. And again, we hear the mention of large teams of experts being brought together to help to solve complex or complicated problems. And I suspect we will hear more about how that is a useful approach. We're going to hear now from Lorena Terrazas. Um, Dr. Neymar ended out talking about the need for understanding indigenous knowledge and uh, we have somebody who would be an expert to help us to get further in our understanding there. So Lorena, please go ahead. Muchas gracias. 
Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It is an honor to be here with this panel of women representing uh, politics, science, and international bodies. So I believe that what is happening today at this regional platform is very important. I bring uh, an outlook with a contribution and I'd like to share with you a small story. Yesterday, I asked for a message, and when you ask for a message, you always get a response. So in the morning, a grasshopper appeared on my leg, and I asked the grasshopper, what message are you bringing to me? What message should I uh, share with the audience and the population who are attentively listening to my uh, contribution. So I said, well, this grasshopper is hopping, jumping, and he has something to say. We need to hop, to make a leap in technology, but with support. This means Latin America, I believe, and communities need to take more technological leaps, embracing traditional knowledge that was mentioned earlier. Dialogue is necessary. We cannot be acting on our own. The academia on the one hand, the government on the other side, and companies. We need to build an alliance to be able to take these leaps to bridge the technological divide that we are suffering from. And we also need to listen to each other among the different sectors so that this knowledge is recognized and escalated, as the representative was just saying, so that science, we know that it has evidence, science studies and produces reports and data, but that information sometimes doesn't succeed in engaging in a dialogue with political decisions, or sometimes that is not reflected in the public budgets that the vice president was mentioning. And communities do not receive the information. So there is no exchange of information. These insects that I was mentioning, in science, they are the bioindicators. Insects announce rains droughts. So when our grandparents said there is an agricultural calendar, there are moments for sowing, for harvesting, there's time for fruit to be harvested, but all of that has been affected. At this moment, we cannot speak of an agricultural calendar because climate change is changing everything. So we were speaking with many women in the Amazon and other communities. They told me, what is climate change? What is this risk thing? Because we don't use those terms. We don't understand it. We just know that it is hotter or that it is very humid or that there are more insects than in the past. We don't have the same uh, life as we used to have in the past. And that's why I'd like to point out that there is a need for interaction, there is a need for engagement, for dialogue. And I would also like to point out that there are many women and uh, girls that are going to university to learn about the Western science, which is very important because it is providing us with the basis for us to be able to engage in communication today. But at the same time, I believe that we shouldn't uh, leave out the cultural essence and our roots. And Latin America is very uh, wealthy in terms of ancestral cultures. We need to seek for local uh, solutions to adapt to climate change related to uh, risks and disasters. This is not an easy task, but I believe that very positive initiatives can arise. We have participated in several projects. One of them had to do with rethinking, and women always think broadly. And they said, there is a flood. What happens immediately? We lose a rice plantations, there's no food, and food security is at risk with disaster risk and with climate change. So you have a broad range of problems. And one of the ladies said, we could think about finding a more, uh, uh, some type of rice that's more resistant to water. So can, how can we relate of this in 
at the same time that we recognize the importance of this science and technology platform. I have been thinking a lot about this because we see science and technology very far from us. We are not embracing it. We are not building in the academic spaces, uh, much less so in other spaces where we would like to engage in interactions. So I believe that there is a new gap there. But at the same time, there is a possibility of making progress. For example, master's programs or specialized studies or scholarships where youth can interact and where communities can provide their contributions and also get something in return for achieving improvements because probably there isn't a single truth, probably experiences are absolutely individual. So I believe that it is important to relate now that we have this new opportunity opening to us. There is a group of scientists of scientists that was mentioned. So it will be interesting to uh, make a relationship between members of the community who can provide uh, concrete and conclusive uh, ideas. And we must uh, acknowledge that risks and disasters obviously place us in a vulnerable situation, but at the same time, it places us in scenarios where human beings need to seek answers. And as a result of this, we continue growing and thinking that integrating ourselves to a globalized society has advantages. But let's not forget that there's essence, an essence in all of us. And once again, America Latin America has a wealth of culture, of languages, different philosophies of life. We, not all of us look at life in the same manner. We need to respect that. When you spoke about technology, we have the technologies coming from the most advanced countries, but we also need to respect our own technologies. At the same time, we need to recognize that today, technologies interact much more fluently. But at the same time, those vulnerabilities are going to be reflected in education and in access to opportunities. And sometimes we need to focus on other issues. At the national level, at there is high sensitivity around the uh, Sendai uh, framework and its pillars. But we also need for national policies to go down to the local so that it permeates the local and so that it can escalate in communities. So we also need to think about those policies and need to uh, permeate in uh, the local areas. And also budgets, once again, they're extremely important because at the end of the day, communities have access to certain budgets, but that depends on this will and interest that was mentioned earlier, on the interest of embarking on joint projects. At the same time, it's very interesting to see that the scientific and political dialogues have come back because this help us to see ourselves on the map. And also, I would like to share with you some data, but I couldn't find any data. I don't know how many women there are in science. I don't know how many indigenous women are working on scientific topics. So that's one of the challenges, to start doing research to build that data, because we also need to find out what the gender gap is. And in talking with the Women's Network, we thought about how specific policies are built, such as gender-based plans. And I would like to raise this issue as well. There are women participating here. The vulnerabilities are already there as women, but what specific answers are there to address that? So there are many topics that we could discuss, but we need that sensitivity that is required for taking into account communities, for communities to be relevant, to gain relevance. I'm extremely happy to be here to share these messages with you, but at the same time, I'm extremely interested in receiving and listening because I have read that many experiences will be shared and presented. So I urge you to think and rethink. We are related to work from the academia. The academia is extremely important. The government is decisive 
for providing guidelines and for relating to each other, but I believe that women are a driving force that are also pushing, and this was unthinkable some years ago. Being on a stage with such strength is something new for us. So I urge you to include more communities and more women in your discussions in your countries, because this is something that will start to happen in countries. Finally, I'd like to emphasize that each one is making a, a big effort on a daily basis, at work, with their families, and as regards children and youth, their participation. I had the great privilege to go to Japan, to Sendai. I got to know Japan, and I said, whoa, I never thought I would have... Uh, attended a school in Japan. I, I went to a school and I lived with Japanese girls. So when in, in arriving there, I think that the first minister of Japan said, we need to talk about early warning systems. And I kept that in my mind since 2015. And I was thinking in my mind, we don't have good telephone coverage. If an earthquake happens, maybe we will not find out because it's already happened. We won't get the message on our cell phone because he was talking about a technology system. So technology needs to be on our side. It shouldn't be our enemy, but it should be this driving force that will help us uh, coexist in a better manner. So I believe that those uh, lessons learned and those systems need to be adapted. And also in Japan, I heard about youth and children, how they are prepared for risk and from a young age, they know what they need to do. We don't know. My parents underwent two floods. My mom could not swim because she was too much afraid of the of, of, of water. We need to learn and we need to teach these other generations to defend themselves. Many of us don't know um, first aid and we are in the process of learning that. This is basic. I, it was at the United Nations that I learned how to uh, uh, behave uh, in the event of a fire through the fire drills. So we are not 100% prepared. I have learned a lot from Chile. This is another takeaway. And when we speak about the community, this is extremely important. Thank you very much. Lorena, thank you very much. Uh, Lorena is the president and coordinator of the NGO Red Pazinde. Uh, I appreciate very much you starting with a uh, reference to an insect and the importance of monitoring biodiversity because it tells us so much about the ecosystem services that we use, often without thinking where they come from until we, well, where did the water go? And that's when we start to think about managing our resources when it's a bit late. So thank you for reminding us and also thanking you for the point about the need to make sure our priorities are reflected in the budget so that we can actually do something useful about those priorities. We are going to hear also now from Andrea. Andrea um, is the director of uh, ECHO for Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Pacific. So that's most of the world. <laughs> so Andrea, could you please tell us your, your perspective? Thank you. Thank you very much. Is this working? Yeah. Gracias. Funciona esto. Es un honor para mí, me siento honrada por la compañía de las oradoras anteriores. Es una gran oportunidad para mí estar aquí. Agradezco al gobierno uruguayo por organizar este evento y por haber incluido, y también a UNDRR por haber realizado este gran esfuerzo. Es sumamente impresionante. Voy a abordar este tema desde la perspectiva de un eh, profesional que se dedica al área humanitaria y también eh, la 
el centro de investigación que trabaja en la Unión Europea en colaboración con otras agencias como la Agencia de Espacial Europea, la Organización Europea para la Explotación de Satélites Meteorológicos o el Centro Europeo para eh, Pronósticos Clima, eh, Climáticos de Alcance Medio. Para los profesionales que trabajan en la respuesta a desastres, hay una sensación de aceleración y repetición de eventos eh, riesgosos que suelen afectar a las comunidades eh, más vulnerables y siempre son las mismas. Y esta, agra este agravante del impacto se debe a la intensidad de los desastres, que es lo cual es preocupa. Often because the resilience is undermined by a multitude of other compounding factors. So understanding a disaster such as the recent earthquake in, in the Middle East cannot be only based on the intensity of the event uh, or even on the number of casualties and injuries. This understanding has to factor in the different vulnerabilities of the affected populations and their recovery capacities. If I look at the earthquake in Turkey and Syria, it also needs to bear in mind the politics, uh, the conflict situation. The response will not be the same in Turkey uh, as it is in Syria in the long term because of the political situation and the conflict prevailing there. And so in the recovery, there will be some who will have a better chance than others simply because of the environment they live in. Yesterday in our DP uh, ECHO workshop, we spoke about evidence in disaster preparedness and anticipation of complex crises in the context of systemic risk. I pleaded for a human-centered rather than hazard-specific preparedness, and I'm convinced that science, or rather sciences, including the social sciences, can help in that respect. Wildfires have hit several countries across the entire Europe last summer. As of mid-August, according to our scientific source, which is the European Forest Fire Information System, more than 660,000 hectares had burned in the European Union. In this part of the world here, we're continuing to witness in your summer a similar dramatic situation in countries such as Chile. Longer-term scientific prediction is telling us that the succession between La Niña and El Niño will lead to drought, which itself will favor forest fires. And it will also be compounded by other food insecurity leading factors, including conflicts which are taking place very far, very far from here. So the criticality of investing in disaster risk reduction and in climate change adaptation is a non-brainer. We need to work together across silos to address the many challenges we're facing. We need to join forces so that we use the financial resources of public policies that was mentioned already before, uh, humanitarian budgets, development budgets, climate finance, private sector investment, so, uh, so that we can work towards the common objective of preventing and preparing for disasters which are causing so much loss, suffering, but also economic uh, downturns. We also need to work across knowledge silos between disciplines and also find ways to feed in the practitioners and the community-based knowledge into the scientific work, as, as Lorena has mentioned before. So that brings me to my second uh, point, which is about the EU scientific work development, which is at the services of policies. Um, in the EU, the development of relevant scientific tools and initiative has been done with the inputs from very initial stages of our policy departments so that uh, they identify what the practical needs are uh, and what the policy priorities for the development of scientific uh, work are. And so there is a very close uh, cooperation between uh, policy and the, scientific, uh, and the scientific world. So it's not by chance, but rather by design, that there is such a close relationship, for instance, between DG ECHO and notably our Emergency Response and Coordination Center, which is basically our operational heart, and space and satellite tools such as Copernicus. The European Union is fostering technological search and uh, research and innovation relevant for disaster risk reduction through programs such as Horizon Europe, which is our big flagship uh, research program for, for seven years, uh, the Community for European Research and Innovation for Security, as well as the Disaster Risk Management Knowledge Center. So coming back to Copernicus, which I think we've heard in, in a lot of side conversations in the couple, last couple of days. So the satellites of Copernicus uh, program are scanning the Earth continuously with uh, cameras, radars, 
and providing real-time information about potential hazards. Such an analysis can help to better understand the potential impact, the exposed populations, economic losses, etc., in the affected areas. We recently provided such overview to Chile. In the past, it has been provided to authorities in Guatemala, uh, Honduras, and Nicaragua in the aftermath of ETA and IOTA. I'm saying the aftermath, but it's actually from before the hurricane started to, to reach the coasts. Um, as well as in Haiti, for instance, where the support uh, after Cyclone Matthew was two years later related to monitoring actually the recovery activities and the way the Earth was reacting back uh, to, that, uh, to that recovery. The Copernicus Emergency Management System is not about only, you know, up there satellite uh, surveillance. It's also about information which is coming from uh, uh, from the ground. So it's counting on an early warning component, and that offers free accessible online information at global level through continuous observation of, of, uh, of the earth uh, and forecasts for river floods, forests, fires, droughts, and a mapping capacity which is used both for immediate uh, response for rapid mode, but also more structural long-term uh, recovery. Um, there are other potential tools which are out there in terms of data analytics using artificial intelligence, which have the potential of making uh, our tools for, for prevention, preparedness or response more uh, perfected. So my third observation is about what does that have to do with what Lorena was telling us and, and the situation on the ground. Um, and that brings my third observation about how disaster preparedness has to bring affected population in the picture. Um, as you know, ECHO's engagement on uh, disaster preparedness in, in the region is part of our DNA in our work in, uh, in, uh, in our humanitarian department. We've been active for more than 25 years across the Americas. 25 years ago was Hurricane Mitch, let's not forget that. And that has been a total investment of 321 million euros to improve disaster preparedness since 1994. Reinforcing capacities, fostering resilience in a region which is particularly exposed and increasingly exposed to all types of natural disasters, which are compounded by economic and social vulnerabilities, whether they're endogenous to the region or exogenous coming from a global situation. Uh, the EU investment in the well-known DPECO program has had a priority to link communities and local authorities with science and with risk management uh, institutions. And I'm going to share a couple of examples of that. Um, early warning systems uh, al along the regions have been developed with the support of the EU, tackling all types of hazards from droughts, landslides, floods to volcanic eruptions. In the development of these systems, local knowledge and awareness combined with scientific innovation have allowed local authorities to plan and to activate measures which are saving lives. Um, I just had yesterday in my hands some leaflets about how to prepare for uh, volcanic eruptions or for earthquakes uh, which were produced in uh, Ecuador with, uh, with our support and which are in Spanish and in Quechua. So, so that element of making also sure that the linguistic variety of the continent is reflected is a very important one. Uh, but besides improving hazard monitoring, technology has also helped to better map vulnerabilities for different kinds of threats. And that has enabled the development of shock responsive social protection systems, which are being developed in the countries of the region with our support. As a matter of fact, these systems have allowed, for instance, the Caribbean government to activate their social protection systems targeting the people most in need. And technology, and most importantly, digital technology, actually makes it possible to engineer social protection systems so they can be shock absorptive, preferably in anticipation of the disaster hitting, and expand a timely support to the expected affected population, something that maybe 15 years ago would simply have not been envisageable to do. Resilient infrastructure and continuity of basic services is also fundamental for being prepared to disasters. And in this sense, I would like to salute all the countries in the region who are going to be adopting or have adopted the safe hospitals and safe schools regional initiatives, which are, which are, which are key. The common factor of all these success stories and these progresses is that it has been the articulation between communities, civil society, risk management and scientific institutions from the local to the national to the regional uh, level.
So my fourth point uh, now, uh, and almost my concluding one, will be how are we bringing the EU scientific resources and what we do in disaster risk reduction very close to the population together in Latin America and the Caribbean. So in the past years, cooperation funding has also been tapped on, and it is increasingly tapped in, uh, to bring EU scientific resources and capability into disaster risk management in favor of Latin America and the Caribbean. And I will just mention two examples. The first one um, is the initiative to create a regional Copernicus Center in Panama that will also serve the countries in the region and which is complemented by the Copernicus Repository in Santiago de Chile. This may strengthen the existing collaboration and create a unique possibility to enhance the current databases that exist with additional data and provide additional products for disaster management authorities from uh, the regions. Uh, from the EU side, this is something which is done across government, which is not always easy because we all know who work in government that internal coordination uh, can also have its challenges, but it's an all government, all EU uh, effort, which includes, of course, the humanitarian aid part, but also the cooperation part, the space uh, people and the ones who are in, in touch and working with the scientific uh, community. Um, another example, uh, which will be discussed later in the week in two workshops, is the support to the wildfire management in Latin America program. And that's one of the components of which is an experts group on forest fires in Latin America and the Caribbean. This was established in 2021 and is shared by the Joint Research Center in collaboration with FAO and the Amazon Treaty Cooperation Organization, way beyond uh, humanitarian aid and disaster risk management competence, but very much uh, supporting, supporting it. Now I come to conclude with my proposal. Um, the EU engagement in Latin America and the Caribbean on disaster spectrum is becoming more and more complete. When a disaster strikes, the EU is present with both our union civil protection mechanism and the humanitarian response. And often we're combining both. And now our investment through many years of DPECO programming in the region is being complemented by uh, uh, scientific support and work done elsewhere in, in, uh, in our system. So increasingly we're bringing in other forms of cooperation and partnership on science and climate change adaptation. Politically, this year is an important one for EU-Latin America Caribbean partnership, as there is an upcoming EU-LAC summit in July, and it will outline an agenda for cooperation and partnership over the coming year. It's both up to both the EU and Latin America to make sure that DRR and disaster preparedness are a key part uh, of this agenda. And all the people, members of government who are here today, you have a role to impulse that with your foreign affairs uh, and cooperation colleagues. It's certainly the wish of my commissioner, Yanis Lenarchic, who visited Colombia and Panama last October. He came back convinced that the EU contribution can build on our disaster preparedness programs, on our civil protection mechanism, on our advisory missions, and our scientific tools to deliver forcefully on the disaster preparedness in Latin America and the Caribbean. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Some interesting points you make about the use of things like satellite imagery and data. And I'm very interested to understand more about how those data are shared with the countries that need them. Um, we have a little bit of time, not much, before the end. I have many, many questions, and we don't have enough time to go through the questions. I'm sure the audience will have many questions as well. So I suspect that many audience members will come and speak to you and grab you and ask you questions. But in the meantime, uh, on the topic of sharing information and data, it's something which I think we need to do more of. But since we only have a few moments for questions. I'd like to, if I may, use my privilege as moderator to address a question to our Vice President. And this has to do with, you had mentioned COVID as a major problem. You also mentioned that there was a drought at the same time. And I'm interested to know, yes, you have these large committees of experts, but do you also get information shared with your neighboring countries? Do you get scientists from other countries to come and help you? And do you help those countries as well in these times of crisis? If you could maybe spend a minute or so and explain how that works. Sí, evidentemente fue una 
Una experiencia. Obviously, it has been a quite an interesting experience. First of all, because the president of the country based the actions lines from the government by first having permanent counseling with all these uh, group of uh, experts from the country. And I think that it was very important once this uh, group was comprised, then we have the director of uh, the group of the Women's Institute, because from the beginning, we knew that the situations we could experience and women and children will be the ones that are, were more vulnerable or were more impacted. So that was a very first uh, clear uh, sign of this commitment. Secondly, the philosophy of the president that announced as a responsible freedom talking to the citizens and making them part of everything that implies that we shouldn't be locked in or confined, but he gave us the freedom and to be able to take care of ourselves and to the members around us. So some public policies were developed and Uruguay also has a scientific system that is completely involved with the rest of the world scientists. Of course, there was an exchange at the global level, so we were able to go along with the different guidelines, especially for those who are more advanced in the area or in the topic. And in that sense, I do believe that experience shown that everything that we had as a responsible freedom concept to keep listening the scientific line and perspective that was not only useful for the pandemic, but also for setting the foundation of reasoning that all the scientific aspects should also be involved in the rest of the topics because it also implies the learning of uh, working together. Sometimes the scientists were just separated from the rest of it. So this was the huge learning and the basis of the foundation and how to face the new problems of this new era. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it's very important to be able to make sure that we can get scientists to work well with policymakers and for them to understand what the problem is that needs to be solved. And sometimes as scientists, we're not very good at communicating with policymakers, but sometimes policymakers are not very good at explaining what they need from a scientist. And it's encouraging to hear that that worked out very well. We have only a few minutes, so I'm going to ask each of the panelists, starting at the far end, to say two things, only two, so it's two sentences because we don't have much time. What you think are the most important things that this group should be thinking about for the next two days? And we start with you and then we come down. So please, two things that you think are the most important thing that they should be thinking about for the next two days. Yeah, of course, the first one is that you think about the proposal I, I gave to you at the end of my... A lo mejor fue, fue la elección de idioma que hizo que el micrófono no funcionara. No, la primera cosa que os pediría es que Maybe pensara... was the language selection that made the microphone not to work, but 
First is just to have this preparation for disaster risk and the agenda with Latin America and the Caribbean. And secondly, complementing today's session is saying that it's not enough to have this contact between politicians and scientists and those who are the policymakers. The contact with those who are on the front line, those who are really in charge of the programs, are really uh, fighting the uh, the forest uh, fires or wildfires, we also need to have the same contact in a more direct way, not only by an interpretation done by the politicians. Although uh, that would be a way to have it in a more efficient communication. Two things: differential policies for communities and the gender plan. Thank you. Good um, I would say that uh, we need to uh, to remain humble. You don't know what you don't know. So even if you don't think that science uh, is going to help you, you need to have scientists around the table from the get-go. That's my first point. The second point is an emergency or a disaster is no time to be developing trust and relationships. So all these need to be done ahead of time. Thank you. <laughs> The first thing as a proposal would be the need of not setting aside the permanent awareness through education and the permanent contact with the citizens. It means, or it means to me that if there is no social involvement, it will be very difficult to have the impact. Secondly, in terms of budgets, according to the progress that these times required. Of course, there's a lot of inequalities, especially in those countries that could have good results due to the scientific level. However, they don't get that point or to that point because there's no budget. And if I want to round up, Based on our moderator's question, the need of having a good communication. Many times communication fails, and in that sense, it seems to me that communication among operators, scientists, and all the people involved or stakeholders should also be addressed to citizens. We need to have communication so we can reach efficiently everything that needs needed to be expressed or said. So, from where the vice president ended, risk communication, how can we do it better at nine? when there is a lot of disinformation and false information, how can we involve the journalists, the media, into this science, technology, government um, relationship? Second is we talk a lot about evidence-based solutions, which is important, but we also need to think about the element of uncertainty. There is a lot of uncertainty in where we live, and we need to be very adaptive. What does that mean for the scientists and the governments? Thank you. Thank you very much. We, I believe, all wish we had more time. It's been incredibly interesting and some really good perspectives from different ways of looking at the same problem. And we've heard some not just interesting theory, but very good examples of how working multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary groups can make a difference, how you can address a situation where you have one disaster and then suddenly another one comes along and yet you can still manage. Um, I appreciate very much the fact that the word budget has been mentioned several times by different people because we sometimes make the mistake of saying, well, we, we know what to do and we have all the plans in place, but we then forget that money has to be then used to implement those plans. 
The only thing I would want to say in the final minute and a half is to, again, pull off my cap as a moderator, is to remind us all that in Latin America and the Caribbean, yes, we have systemic risk, we have multiple hazards, there are volcanoes, there's um, tropical cyclones, and then extratropical cyclones, which is crazy. <laughs> we've got the volcanoes, we've got the earthquakes. Let us remember that we also, in addition to uh, the problems of pandemics and so on, we are also custodians of some of the most important biological diversity on the planet. And that biological diversity helps to maintain the climate and we must take care of that in order to help make sure that climate change does not get worse. So our forests, our coral reefs, all very vital to make sure that we can continue to live and prosper and improve human well-being. It's not going to be easy, but we've heard from all of you different ways of being able to address a complex or complicated problem, sometimes even a wicked problem. I thank you very much, and I hope everybody will be able to interrogate you more and use the examples that you've given us so that we can move forward. Thanks again. Muy bien. De esta manera... Estamos dando por finalizada la sesión plenaria sobre ciencia y tecnología para la gestión. We would like to conclude this plenary session about science and technology for the prevention and mitigation of disaster risk. Thank you for the moderation and thank you to all speakers for their own presentations. This was the meeting that opened the session. It was a great way to break the ice. The meeting that we will have for three days in the eighth platform for the Americas and the Caribbean for disaster risk reduction. I also would like to greet the Vice President Beatriz Argimón. We would like to remind you that the platform, we are going to promote sustainability and respect towards the environment. That is why we would like to recommend not use uh, single-use plastics, also to use recyclable materials. In order to make things easier, we have also added some water dispensers and also we have also installed some recycling stations so you can get paper, plastics, and organic residue or wastes. Before we end up this session, we would like to invite you to go to the Monte Carlos room so you can have a look at the expo. We also listen for the different uh, presentations that along the three days, all the reference will be doing here in the Ignite stage. Good evening, and we'll get together in few time, in few minutes. Thank you very much.